Hey, what's up, 128? It's almost the end of May and summer is just around the corner, so I want to give you guys a couple updates about what's coming up for the summer. Uh, as you know, we haven't been able to meet for a couple months now, and my prayer is that over the summer we can have a couple fun events planned, so we have a couple things that we're thinking of, so just pray that uh, God would allow those things to happen. Uh, I really miss you guys. I really miss hanging out with you guys, so hopefully we can uh, do some, some cool things like pool parties or game nights or or maybe some movie nights here in the 128 room. Um, so that's coming up for the summer. Um, we also have a couple seniors who are graduating this year, and we're going to be having uh, a graduation celebration planned for hopefully July or August, uh, whenever they allow us to meet again. Um, so just keep your ears open for that, and hopefully we can see each other as soon as 128. Uh, today I want to talk to you. Today's going to be the second to last message in 1 John. So it's crazy to think that we have one message today and then one more message next week and then we're finished with this book, um, which is super exciting. And today I want to talk to you guys about sin and the power of prayer. So sin and, and the seriousness of sin and the power of prayer. I think a lot of times we trivialize sin. We don't think it's as really serious as it is. Is And I think that's exactly what Satan wants us to think, that disobedience is not deadly and that sin is not serious, that we can uh, obey, no, disobey God's word and not suffer the consequences of it. Or we start to think, man, sin is not that bad. Like everyone around me is doing it. And if everyone around me is doing it, then it's not as bad as maybe it might be. And that can't be further from the truth. And we'll see why today. So we think that sin is not serious. Another thing that we don't believe is that prayer is not powerful. And I know this is true of my own life. Is uh, Sometimes I show that I don't believe that prayer is powerful just by the fact that I don't pray enough. I'm not asking God for help in uh, my own walk with Christ and overcoming my sin. I don't ask God to deliver other people from their sins. Um, I don't ask God to provide for me because I simply don't think that prayer is powerful. Uh, but today we're going to see that prayer is immensely powerful. Immensely powerful. So here's our main point for today in our message. So we're going to be in 1 John 5, 16 to 17. So 1 John 5, 16 to 17. So if you could turn there uh, right now. And here's our main point for today. Sin is deadly. Prayer is powerful. So sin is deadly and prayer is powerful. Let's read 1 John 5, 16 to 17. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask, and God will give him life to those who commit sins that do not lead to death. There is sin that leads to death. I do not say that one should pray for that. All wrongdoing is sin, sin but there is sin that does not lead to to death. So the first point we see here is that sin is deadly. Sin is deadly. And that's in verse 17. So we're going to kind of go a little bit out of order. We're going to look at verse 17 first. And John says, all wrongdoing is sin. So John defines sin for us. And he says, all wrongdoing is sin. Now this word wrongdoing is literally unrighteousness. And what John is saying is everything that does not conform with God's standard of righteousness is sin. Now, I think the reason he's kind of stating the obvious is that you and I so often minimize sin or don't say it's as serious as it is. But here's the thing. There's one standard of righteousness. There's one standard of right and wrong. And that standard is God. Because God is perfectly and totally righteous. He is righteous in himself, and he gets to define what is righteous for mankind. And he defines that for us in his word. He gives us his standard of righteousness in his word. The law of God in the Old Testament showed the nation of Israel what was right and wrong, and the, inter the eternal principles behind the Old Testament are carried forward into the New Testament, and those are the standards that apply to us today. So we see what is right and wrong according to God's Word. And everything that is out of line with or not in line with God Himself and His Word 
is sin. Now, this is so important because you and I cannot excuse our actions away. I, I don't know about you, but I try to justify myself. I try to minimize my actions. I say that instead of sinning, I made a mistake. I made a bad choice instead of acting wickedly. We don't just have a bad moment. We sin. We can't say, man, that's not who I was. Like, I know I said that. I know I said that really mean, unkind, foolish thing. But let me tell you, that's not who I really am. If you read the, or listen to the apologies of like celebrities and actors and politicians, so often they say, I'm sorry, that's not who I was. But they don't say, this is what they don't say. I'm so sorry, I did terribly. I didn't just make a mistake, I sinned. I sinned against you and I sinned against God. So I ask for your forgiveness. I don't make any excuses for my wrong behavior. They don't say that. That's, that's repentance. That's the language of repentance as we've been learning about in, uh, in big service or from Pastor Micah. Um, they minimize sin. So here are some examples of how you can minimize sin. For example, when you get angry and talk back to your parents, you might just think, man, I was just getting really heated. I was just getting really into it. No, 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 you weren't just getting really heated. You were disrespecting them when you were arguing back to them. When we love our hobbies more than God, so guys, don't, please don't mishear me. It's, it's okay to love our hobbies and to, to be passionate about things like surfing and soccer and woodworking and all that. But when we love those things more than God, so often we call those things our passion or maybe something we're like totally devoted to and and obsessed about. Guys, that's not our passion or obsession or devotion. That's idolatry, right? When we love something more than God, we're committing the sin of idolatry. Another example, when you fail to carry out an instruction that your parents gave you. Say maybe you even forgot or you got distracted or you just got busy doing other things. Instead of just saying, I forgot, I'm sorry, I think what we should be saying is, I forgot, maybe that's true, but because I forgot, I disobeyed you, mom and dad, so please forgive me. Another example, when we don't share our possessions with those in need, maybe we see someone like a family member or our brother or sister in Christ, or maybe just our own physical brother and sister, and they need something, and we don't give them what they need, the world calls it maybe being stingy, maybe being frugal, Guys, that's not being stingy. That's being unloving. That's being selfish. That's loving yourself more than someone else. That's sin. So we need to call sin for what it is, sin. Because if we don't, we don't really see how serious it is. And if we don't see how serious sin is, man, we're not going to run away from sin and towards Christ and His righteousness. Because all of our unrighteousness, all of our thoughts, actions, and, and deeds and, and words that are not in accordance with God and His Word are not just mistakes, they are sins. So we need to call sin for what it is. And sin is, is absolutely terrifyingly wicked. It's so wicked. Guys, I've been a, a Christian since 2006, right? For about 14 years. Coming up on 14 years, actually, this June. And the more I walk with Christ, the more I realize how amazing and glorious and holy He is, the more I realize how sinful and wretched and depraved and wicked I am. And that doesn't cause me to run away from Christ. Man, when I see how wicked I am and how glorious He is, that makes me want to go to Him even more. Now, I think you and I don't think sin is serious because we're surrounded by it, right? We're surrounded by it. For example, right, if you're in the ocean, you don't think, man, there's, like, it's so wet here because you're surrounded by water. You don't really think about water when you're in the ocean. When you're in the desert and you see, like, a lake or a stream or something, you're like, that water is so amazing because there's no water in the desert and you think, man, that water is so amazing because there's, There's so little of it there. So maybe another example. Let's take the example of a movie with like a really bad, inappropriate 
sexual scene, right? It's, it's really inappropriate, and you're like, man, that was, I shouldn't have seen that. I wish I didn't watch that movie. So we watch these movies sometimes, and we don't, sometimes we don't really even think about it. We don't think, man, that was so wicked. We just think, well, I've seen movies that are worse. Hopefully that's not the case, but sometimes we say, I see movies that are worse, or it's not as bad as those other movies, or that was about average compared to, to those other movies. So we, we minimize sin because we're surrounded by a culture, by a world that's filled with sin. When you turn on the TV, when you watch movies, it's just like, it's, it comes at you like a flood. And when a flood comes at you, a little drop of water isn't that noticeable. But, but think about this. Take that one inappropriate scene from that movie, and instead of comparing it to Hollywood, take that and bring it into the light of God's holiness, His infinite, pure, undefiled holiness. How does that one scene from that movie look now? It looks pretty bad, doesn't it? Compared to God's infinite purity, Sin is unbelievably wicked. Think about the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve ate the fruit that they shouldn't have. There was no sin in mankind up until that point. And because they lived in a perfect world, their sin was that much worse. It looks that much worse. And I think you and I, instead of comparing our sin or minimizing our sin because we live in a world of sin, we need to take our sins into the light of God's presence to see it like he sees it. Satan wants us to believe that sin is not serious, but we need to see sin how God sees it. Because God is life and sin brings death. God wants us to enjoy his presence. Sin takes us away from his presence. And that's the definition of death, is being separated from God. The book of Romans says that the wages of sin is Death. Sin is deadly. It brings about death. Even God told Adam and Eve, in the day that you eat this fruit, you will surely die. So sin is absolutely deadly. I, I want to I love what God loves. And I want to hate what God hates. I want to see this world as God sees this world. Because I know that when I see this world as God sees this world, It's only then that I'm going to act and live rightly. Because if I don't love what he loves and hate what he hates, then I'm going to act wickedly. So I pray that you and I can love what God loves and hate what God hates. Now even the believer, right, even mature and strong believers can fall, not just can, will fall into sin. No matter how long you walk with Christ, no matter how many decades you've been with Him, the oldest saints will still sin. They can get stuck in or or captivated by or even temporarily enslaved by sin. Now sin is, is not just serious, it is enslaving. Like once we start tasting of it, it's like drinking from salty water, we just want more and more and more and more, and we need increasing levels of sin, increasing dosages of sin to bring us that same level of excitement and and happiness. And at some point, it's just like this thing is is not bringing me happiness at all. So sin is, is serious, and it's enslaving, it's captivating, it seeks to bring us into bondage. Now, how can a believer overcome sin? How can you, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, overcome sin. Prayer. Remember, we we said that sin is deadly and prayer is powerful. Sin is so deadly, but prayer is even more powerful. And that brings us to our second point. Prayer is powerful. Look at verse 16. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, He shall ask and God will give him life to those who commit sins that do not lead to death. So John is saying this, sin is deadly, it's serious. And if you see a brother or sister in Christ and you're concerned about them, you're 
you're worried about them because you know that sin is going to bring about devastating consequences in their life. John says, do this. Pray. If there's someone you care about that's trapped in sin, pray. And you should be concerned about that person. And you notice that John says, if anyone sees his brother, that means that we should be on the lookout, looking after our brothers and sisters in Christ, watching them, not not for the purpose of judging them or looking down at them, but watching their lives closely because we care about them. I, I would want the people that are close to me, friends in my life, to be watching my life closely because I want them to tell me the moment I start stepping off the path of righteousness, to to come to me in love and say, Luke, I am concerned about you because I'm seeing you moving away from Christ. So do you have people like that in your life who, if you walk away from Christ and you start veering off the path of His Word, man, in a moment they're going to be right at you and say, hey, I am so concerned about you. I'm praying for you that God would deliver this, uh, deliver you from this sin. I see this sin in your life and, and I would ask you to consider whether you are walking in sin or not. If you don't care whether your brother or sister in Christ is walking in sin, maybe you're like, hey man, that person is really conceited, or that person is really jealous or angry or selfish or greedy, or that person is like doing all kinds of bad things and I don't even care about that person, then I would say that you need to search your heart to see whether there is love in your heart. For that person or not because the moment we stop caring for those around us means that our walk with God has gone cold because if we love God then we're gonna love his people so if we see our brother sinning our brother in Christ sinning John says we should pray we should ask God we should ask God to deliver our friend from sin and you can say something like this God my my friend is stuck my friend is enslaved to pornography. My friend loves his hobbies way too much. He uses foul language. He loves his money. He loves being cool and all that. He loves you know, being in a relationship with someone more than, more than you. God, I'm concerned about my friend. Please deliver my friend from this sin. And if your friend is a genuine believer in Jesus Christ, then the promise that you have in verse 16 is that when you pray that, God will answer your prayers. Look at what God does. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask and God will give him life. Remember, in last week's message, we saw that that John said, if we ask anything in accordance with God's will, God hears us and he answers us. So this is in accordance with God's will. We pray that God would deliver our friends from sin, And if they are a believer in Jesus Christ, then God is going to answer that prayer. God is going to answer that prayer. And it says that God will give, John says, God will give him life. God gives life to that believer. Now think about this with me. If God gives life to that believer who's in sin, what does that say about what that believer is tasting of and experiencing as he's stuck in sin. If God needs to give him life, then that believer is tasting and experiencing death. Which means that the believer, the genuine believer in Jesus Christ, can be tasting of experiencing death. Which is crazy to think about because God has given us life and there's a sense in which nothing can take away the life that God has given us and in internal sense that's totally true right that that we are not as believers destined for hell and eternal death we are going to be with God and enjoy eternal life with him but today and now as we fight our sin as we give into sin we taste the consequences of sin and that is death And this is the madness of sin, that God gives us life, not just in the future, but today. God gives us life today, and He wants us to enjoy that life now. And the life that He gives us is filled with with joy and peace and blessing and forgiveness and grace and contentment and love. That's the life that God gives us as we 
know Him and, and enjoy that life with Him. But when we choose sin, we trade life and all of its benefits for sin and death right? and all of its consequences. We trade life for death. We choose sadness and turmoil and discontentment and conflict, anger, jealousy, bitterness. That's death, guys. It's unbelievably miserable. David, King David in the Old Testament as a believer, when he committed that sin of adultery with Bathsheba, he talks about just his, his flesh and his bones just rotting away and God's judgment and discipline coming on him. And he says, man, I was miserable. I was just totally, totally down and out. Because sin promises us life, but it gives us death. So let me ask you this, right? Let me ask you this. Are you living in sin now? Are you cultivating hidden and secret sin? Are you totally obsessed with, and not just obsessed with, are you idolizing something more than God? And let me ask you, how is that working out for you? If you're loving something, the creation, more than God, is it bringing you joy? I mean, yeah, maybe in the short term it does, but the more and more and more you give yourself to that, is it bringing you the joy and peace and happiness that you thought it would? And the answer is undeniably no. No. Because the creation, that which is finite, cannot give us that which only the Creator who is infinite can give us. He can give us life and joy and blessing. This creation cannot. And ultimately, all of our idols boil down to this. We don't worship, we don't just worship things that are outside of us. Our greatest idol is ourself. We worship ourself. And all of these things that we give ourselves to, we give ourselves to them because we worship ourselves and we think that we deserve joy and happiness and, and fame and blessing and riches. We are our biggest idols. So if we want to really deal with sin at its root, we need to repent of self-worship, worshiping ourselves. And we need to replace that with the worship of God. And, and guys, let me just be totally open with you guys. That's, that's something that God has really been convicting me of just in this last week or so. That my biggest idol is myself. All of my other idols are just a, a reflection of the love of self. And I need to repent of that. I need to put that to death. I need to, to love and cherish and, and worship Christ to delight in Him more than anything else. So I would just ask you guys, as you think of me, to pray for me, that I would worship Christ and God more than anything in this world. Because when I don't do that, when I veer off that path, yeah, maybe it's enjoyable for a little bit, but in the long run, I get cranky, I get bitter and angry and jealous and discontent. I'm experiencing death instead of the life that God has given me. So I just ask you to pray for me, that, that God would deliver me from the love of self and bring me into the love of God. And I know that if you pray that for me, then God will answer that prayer and God will give me life. And if there's any way that I could be praying for you, any sins that you're struggling with, I want to know so that I can pray for you. And I know that God will answer my prayers for you to be delivered from that sin. I think which just brings us to the subject of, of confession and transparency and being open with one another. If there's a sin that you're struggling with, not if, guys, we're all struggling with sin. The sins that you are struggling with, I want to challenge you this week to open up to someone. Maybe that's your small group leader, your parents, your friends. Open up about your struggles with sin and ask them to pray for you. Because we know that in this verse, John says, that if we pray for our brother who's in sin, then God is going to give that person life. So part of what God uses to bring us away from sin and into righteousness is prayer because prayer is powerful. Just like we said last week, guys, 
God is, is waiting for us to come to Him and to, to bring our requests before Him, to come to His throne of grace and just take all of our needs and just lay them down at His feet and say, God, I, I, I need your help. God, I need your help to overcome my sin. I need you to deliver me. I need you to deliver my friends from sin because temptation is strong and sin is seductive and it's enslaving and it's destructive. God, please deliver us from the evil one. And then God will answer our prayers. Now let's look, at, let's look at verse 16. John says that we should pray for a brother who sins and that sin is not leading them to death. And then he says at the end of verse 16, there is sin that leads to death. I do not say that one should pray for that. And you might, you might be like, wait a second, time out. I thought you said that all sin is deadly and it is. All sin leads to death. It does. Because the wages of sin is death. But John here is narrowing in on one kind of sin that leads to death. And he says that we should not pray for people who are going into that sin. So what's John talking about? I think in the context of 1 John, John is dealing with the subject of false teachers and apostasy. Apostasy. Apostasy is someone who formerly was part of the church, someone who knew the gospel, and then tragically turned their backs on the gospel and rejected it. Now, now let me let me be careful here because there are people who are part of the church then walk away and then come back. But I think the difference is this. There are some people who walk away from the church and they say, you know what? I know the gospel is true. I believe that the Bible is true. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God, but, but I love my sin. I just got to have this sin. I just, I just got to have this thing that I really want. And they haven't totally rejected the gospel, but they've chosen this sin over Christ. And that is not apostasy. But this is apostasy. Someone is part of the church. They know the truth. They know the gospel. They know the Bible. They know the message of eternal life. And then they slowly start to doubt it. And that doubt turns into rejection. And then they say the Bible is not true. The Bible is just the work of a human and not the work of God. Jesus is not the Son of God. He is not God Himself. You cannot be saved just by grace. You, you have to work your way to God to earn His favor. They might say that Jesus was just a human and not God Himself. They might say that, that God is not triune. And that is apostasy. So I, and I want to be careful too, because someone could perhaps join a false group and somehow rationalize in their mind that that false group is teaching the same things that we teach, even though that's not true. And I would say that, that I believe that that person has not committed apostasy. But if that person says, I totally buy into what this group is saying, and I reject what the clear teaching of the Bible is, then I would say that that person has committed apostasy. And John is saying that, that those who commit total rejection those who totally reject the truth, we should not pray for them because that sin leads to death. Why? The sin of apostasy is so serious because the person who does it, who commits it, is cutting themselves off from the one thing that can give them life and that is the gospel. If someone rejects the gospel and says that it is not true, then there is, according to the word of God, no hope for them. Now, I want to be careful too because as a, as a human, as a person, I, I want to be careful before saying someone is totally gone and is beyond the point of no return because I do not know that. God knows. So I would be hesitant to say 100% definitively this person is, is beyond the point of no return. So if you know someone who has walked away from the faith or, or maybe is doubting it or maybe has rejected it, I would encourage you to keep on praying for that person, to pray that God would have mercy on them. I would not tell you to stop praying for them. But what John is saying is that there is a point at which someone goes beyond the point of no return. And there is no hope for that person because they have totally rejected the gospel. And that's serious. And that should cause you and me to treat the sin of apostasy in our own lives 
seriously. Because guys, unbelief is so near to us. There are so many times where we doubt God's word, we doubt his goodness, we doubt his character. And we have to fight that doubt tooth and nail. We cannot let that doubt begin to build in our minds because that doubt will continue to infect us if we don't treat it. That doubt will continue to spread. And if we let that doubt spread, then we will commit apostasy. And the way that we can fight that doubt is to is to be committed to the Word of God, to trust in it, to believe in it, to obey it, to ask God to help us in our unbelief. I, I think about the person who came to Jesus, right? And Jesus told him, or he told Jesus, I believe, Jesus, but help my unbelief. And I, I think that's something that we should be praying. Jesus, I believe you. I believe in your Word, but help me in my unbelief. Because unbelief is so near at hand for all of us. So guys, let us believe the Word of God. Let us be totally committed to it. Let us commit ourselves to the truth. And let us not dabble in apostasy and error. So our main point was, sin is deadly. Sin is terrifyingly deadly. You cannot sin without consequences. You cannot sin without experiencing death. Even a believer when they sin, experiences the consequences of death. Sin is deadly, and prayer is powerful. Sin is deadly, prayer is powerful. If you are stuck in sin, ask others to pray for you. If you see someone else in sin, bring them before the throne of God, and God will answer our prayers. So may we be people of prayer, And may we be people who love what God loves and hate what God hates. And what does God hate? Unrighteousness and sin. And what does He love? He loves that which is pure and holy and true. He loves righteousness. So may we commit ourselves to what He loves and reject and flee from what He hates. God bless you guys. I love you guys. I pray that you guys will walk in the truth And I pray, I pray that we will be reunited again so that we can gather again to sing praises and and to just fellowship and, and be in the Word together. God bless, guys.